was advertised as a physics day, but we needed like one uh, responsible adult to keep us in line. So Ian's actually a, a mathematician, but uh, he's actually going to be telling us about uh, about biology. So you've got you've got everything uh, all combined here. Okay. Thanks. Well, I mean, I don't think I'm a responsible adult or a mathematician or a <laughs> biologist. So you know, don't take that too seriously. But you know, it's Friday afternoon. It's the last session of the workshop, so you can take things a bit high level. And I'm going to talk about some examples of some complex biological features and some of the ways in which people have thought about complexity changing over time and, some, and the mechanisms by which complexity changes over time. And I think I'm going to cover a lot of stuff that people have already talked about. But, you know, maybe we can have some ideas, maybe a bit of conversation with the audience about some of the things that have come up already. So I, mean, I think this is quite a good summary of the way biologists, or a lot of biologists, think about complexity uh, in life. And really, there's sort of two things here. So, you know, one is that changes in complexity sort of occur in qualitative steps, right? So, you know, single-celled you know, single animals become, uh, single-celled creatures become multicellular, um, you know, and then don't go back. You know, animals, evol animals evolve into sort of higher groups, so they form social groups, social groups become more complex over time. And, you know, obviously there's flux between these things, but, you know, in some sense, the most complex thing around has got more complex over time. But of course, there's no particular reason to think that this would happen, right? There's no reason why it should be better to be more complex, no reason why things should get more complex over time. So this is, so, you know, in some ways this is a bit of a puzzle. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm, not, so I'm not making any statements about why this would be true or not. Right? Absolutely. So, I mean, this is a kind of like straw man view of, of evolution, right? Okay, so this is kind of silly, but you start with simple life and it becomes more complex over time and there's a sort of progression. And then, you know, obviously no one really believes this, but people still show it on slides. You know, apes become progressively more upright and eventually become humans. Okay, right. So this is kind of... You know, we don't really think this happens, but of course, in some cases, it does happen, right? So, you know, it might be a good model for things like the evolution of the mammalian eye, right? So, the, you know, the mammalian eye starts out as, you know, a relatively simple system of photoreceptors, and it becomes progressively more complex over time through, you know, small additions and small increases in complexity. And eventually, you end up with a very complex structure. I mean, this is an example of the evolution of drug resistance in Staph aureus. So, this sort of circle is showing you the, the Staph aureus genome, and the sort of outer five circles are changes which have happened in order to confer resistance. So, you know, these are these sort of red bits on the outside are genes which have been absorbed from other species of bacteria, and then these are uh, insertions, I think, and then the single nucleotide changes on the inside. So, in some sense, you know, you've presented this bacteria with a complex problem that of evading an antibiotic. And it's come up with a complex solution to it. And it's done that through a series of small steps. And, and there's, some kind of, there's some kind of implication here that it's better to be more complex, that you can solve problems by becoming more complex and finding a way around them. A sort of contrasting view, and this is sort of what Stephen Jay Gould called the drunkard's walk view of evolution, is that, you know, it's just totally random. So your lineage and... You know, from generation to generation, you might get more complex, you might get less complex, uh, but it's just totally random. It doesn't have to be any pressure in one direction or the other. And so if we plot, and here complexity means whatever you think it means, if we plot complexity and the distribution of, of complexity of life, what you, mean, yeah? Sir, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. <laughs> but for now, whatever you think it means, it <laughs> means. Right? As long as you agree that these things are more or less in order of increasing complexity. Okay, so I, I feel like it's it's uh, un, unfair to the uh, okay, it's unfair to the stegosaurus. Yeah. But okay, but, you know, <laughs> so it's not necessarily strictly greater, right? But you start so you start off with you know a bunch of uh, stuff which isn't very complex, and, and over time the distribution just kind of spreads out, and you know because there's a barrier at zero, you know the most complex thing you observe becomes more complex over time. Eventually, 
you get bacteria and then life, right? And you know, if there's a if there's a pressure in the in the sort of leftward direction, eventually it hits a stationary distribution. Otherwise, it just keeps on spreading out forever. Okay. Are there examples where you get organisms that in some way are complex but then become simpler? So the random walk takes a step backward. Well, yeah. So well, I mean, in some sense, right? So Monty says no. Viruses. Viruses, right? Um, like, Eastern well. Right. Yeah, and those, and, and right. Like, uh, also parasites. Uh, parasites. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, also even in you know, I mean, I said the eye was a complex structure, right? If you go and live in a cave for a hundred generations, you'll lose your eyes. So, you know, yes. Um, but you know, there does seem to be something that says you know some of these barriers are kind of sticky, right? So once you get past some level of complexity, it's sort of harder to go back. And and so that so that sort of irreducible complexity. And you know, here's a, uh, there are there's a number of ways that can evolve, but here's an example. So you start with a gene that produces this protein, and you rely on this Y-shaped domain of the protein for some function. At some point, the gene gets duplicated. Now you have two copies. At some point, you get mutations on different parts of each of the copies of the gene. And so, but, so now you know, these proteins don't fold properly, but they sort of half fold. And by using the two proteins together, you can still get the same effect. Right, so now you've made a more complex structure, right? But you can't go, you can't go back, and this is and this is called subfunctionalization, and and this is a sort of brief yeah, literature. It's also loss of function. I mean, that also happens. This is you, you mean this is a loss of function, or? No, I'm saying that also happens after gene duplication that one just loses. Right, 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 exactly. So I mean, you know, lots of things can happen after gene duplication, right? So after gene duplication, one of these can just decay and and you lose it, or, you know, one of these can take on a new function, right? So. I'm not saying this is the only thing that happens when gene get, genes get duplicated. Well, for it to be a ratchet, then you wouldn't be able to use it. So I'm not saying this happens in every case. No. But in some cases, this happens. And when it does, you can't go back. Right. Um, and the important thing here is that you know, none of these steps have to be adaptive. right? Well, they don't all have to be adaptive. So you know, this gene duplication can just be neutral. You know, this, change can, you know, this, change, this change can be neutral or deleterious, and then probably, you know, if this is a recovery mutation, it's adaptive. But, you know, this doesn't, this, this process can happen neutrally, right? Why do you say that this, the, the last structure is more complex than the middle one? Just because there's two genes, or the first Right, because you because there's sort of, because there's two genes involved, right? Two genes have to work well, together, two genes proteins have to work together. Anyway? I mean, how do we, we call it? Uh, two proteins have to work together. Okay, okay. I mean, you know, Okay. So two is more complicated than one. Is what you mean. <laughs> two is more complicated than one if one of the two can't do anything on its own. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about the complexity of the genome and some, the complexity of some genomic features. I'm going to talk about the human genome first because it's the best genome, and. You know, how complex is the human genome? So it's not really clear how to measure this, right? How big is it? Let's start with that. It's pretty big. It's three billion bases. But actually, that's not that big. It's not that much information. You know, it's about 750 megabytes. And, you know, there aren't that many differences between our genomes. Uh, so if I want to store the genome of the entire human species, everyone in the world, you know, I can probably do that in order of 10 petabytes, right? It's not a huge amount of data. CERN generates 15 petabytes of data a year, right? So you know, there's not that much information there. And, and so even more surprisingly, actually most of that information probably doesn't do anything, right? So you know, I apologize if, th if this is obvious, but uh, you know, most of the human genome is made up of transposable elements, right? Almost half of the, of the genome is made up of transposable elements. And these are just sort of stretches of DNA which have the ability to replicate themselves. And so, you know, they just sort of sit there, and every so often they replicate themselves, they move a, a, around the genome, right? Exactly. So actually, only 0.05% of the transposable elements in the human genome are active, right? So they may well so have a function in terms of just occupying space. They, they, may, they may, yeah, they may just take up space. They may just or be spaces. They may, or, they, or they may take on secondary function, right? Or the space may be a function. The space may be a function as well. So, they, I mean, they make up, intro, they make up most intronic sequence. No, no, uh, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. Just it seems like there are major problems that are at, at 
estimating the amount of information encoded in the human genome. Like it, it seems like that uh, estimate you present is you you yeah. you translate it into a string, and then you count the number of bytes. But that's not how information is encoded. That's true. That's the sort of upper limit on the amount of information, right? I mean, I'm what well, you know. I would, I would, I, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that is. You know, I'm just translating one number into another, right? I'm, I'm not making any comments about. I mean, it's got a, it's got a three-dimensional structure. Right. There are, you know, and there's a and there's a machinery which uses yeah, that. Yeah, there, there are ways that things interact in a continuous way instead of being zero one bits. Yeah. Wait. Okay. Sorry. So you you're saying <clears throat> that there's more information in there than like say bases plus methylation? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Key elements recognize the three-dimensional structure of DNA, which a whole set of sequences will have the right structure for the PM element to recognize. But where does that three-dimensional structure come it from? It comes from the set of sequences that are responsible for that three-dimensional folding of the DNA. Exactly. Right, so but those, are, sequ those are sequences, right? I mean, that... Yeah. Well, yeah. But, but the There's function is actually the three-dimensional yeah, structure. Yeah, the folding's not determined by just the sequence, right? There's these chaperone proteins and these things. Where do those come Yeah, but from? They, those are sequence as well, right? I, I mean, no, look, I'm not, look, I'm not saying that's all the information in the genome, right? I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just putting some numbers down here. I mean, it talks about kind of like the virgin complexity, right? So. I, I wouldn't say that, but, you know, that's definitely a question you should think about. Right? So, I mean, that's an open question, right? Look, what, you know, what is the information content of the genome? How should we measure that? How should we count it? How should we, how should we compare information content between different genomes? Right? And, and I, I don't have any answers for that. You know, people are here's a, here's we'll, a starting we'll address point. that in the second half. Um, okay, so you know, th so and, and, and there's quite quite a lot of the genome is, is viral DNA as well, and, and you know, again, that might do something, but you know, it's probably not fundamental. And then there's there's, there's about ten percent of the genome that we, we you know we really have a good idea what it does, and then, and then there's about a quarter of it which is you know we don't know what it does, but it's not conserved across species. You know, it's probably not very important, and and you know. I should say that, that you know there are wide estimates of these numbers, and, and people disagree. I mean, most you know this is a sort of uh, this is a kind of meta analysis, and, and they and most people would say about ten percent. But you know, <coughs> I'm not saying that's that's definitely true. So, um, yeah. This junk. Uh, yeah. At least in the bacteria, a lot of it is. Uh... Bacteria, are di bacteria are different. Uh -huh. I mean, bacteria have have almost all bacteria bacterial sequence is, is coding. Coding or immediately regulatory. Yeah. And, and I, okay, I, dis, I, I say most, most bacterial sequence I is. I okay. But the, but the I mean, depends on the bacteria, right? Yeah. That's, you know. the, the rest is yeah. partly meant to be uh, ready for eventualities that are not there. Well, that's a, that's a hypothesis, right? I mean, yeah, sure. Okay, so, I mean, they, you know, people argue this about junk. D okay, this is the distinction between junk DNA and garbage DNA, right? So, you know, garbage is stuff that you throw out of your house, right? Junk is stuff you keep in the garage in case it might be useful one day. Okay, so that, I mean, that, that's actually quite, that, you know, that's actually quite a good analogy for, for this, right? But, 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 it's a, but it's a hypothesis, it's not, you know. Okay. Okay. So are you sure it's just a third? I, I thought that there was much higher fraction with coding in most bacteria. I thought it was a, a, a large majority. Is there an actual no. biologist in the house? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I, I was told just yesterday that uh, they think that there's a lot of junk, and they got it down to one-third the size, and it's functional. Yeah, I mean, it, it does some... Yeah, that's what he's saying, that in bacteria, it's very small. Yeah. It's, there's very little junk. It's, it's all... It's I'm, saying, all I'm saying it's only one-third is useful, two-thirds is junk. The problem, no, the problem is in bacteria, they have lots of operons that are functional in specific environments, dealing with right. iron, dealing with zinc, dealing with yeah. radium. If you don't hit those things, you can chop them out, it doesn't make any difference. So the genome of an E. coli that will survive on a plate, the genome can be vastly smaller than yeah. an E. coli that's going to suffer the normal vicissitudes of what happens in your stomach. Okay, so there may be a little bit of a technical miscommunication. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think I, I'm going to carry on here, but let's... Yeah, yeah. Okay, what about the genomes of other animals? So, you know, genome size varies quite a lot. All mammalian genomes are about three gigabases. The smallest animal genomes we know are, are about one-tenth of the size. The Fugu is, is the smallest animal genome. I, there, there are some... Okay, I know this is not an animal. 
there, there are some bigger genomes. There are genomes that are maybe an order of magnitude bigger than the human genome. Uh, well, so this is, okay, this is, I just put this up here. This is often cited as an example of like the biggest genome in this an amoeba, and, and it's supposed to have an almost 700 gigabase genome. It's, it's probably, this is probably a mismeasurement. So I, I'm not sure this is actually true, but you know, th these things have mul multiple copies of the genome, and, and so it's hard to measure. Okay, so but, you know, and, and looking more widely across sort of life, you know, genome size varies by six orders of seven orders of magnitude here. You've got eukaryotes in, in green, and, and you can see you know we the animals that we've been looking at are sort of up here. And prokaryotes have smaller genomes, viruses have smaller genomes. Okay. So we, but we, you know, we saw that genome size varies quite a lot across animals. So what about the useful component of genome size? Well, you know, again, we don't really know how to measure that. But you know, one way of measuring it would be the number of genes. So, and that scales. So on some level, you know, if you just look at animals, you know, the number of genes doesn't scale very much with genome size. And, and genome size looks like more or less a neutral process. But you know, across life, the size of the genome, the, the number of genes scales more or less with the size of the genome. Um, so, you know, the number of, counting the number of genes might be a reasonable way of, of thinking about complexity on a, on a large scale. Uh, you know, and of course these genes can interact, so this is a small part of a gene interaction network involved in angiogenesis and pancreatic cancer. And so each of these circles is gene, and these lines show the interaction between the genes, the purple lines are protein-protein interactions, and, and the yellow and green lines of, of protein DNA interactions. This is, the, this is the surface of the cells, and these are cell surface proteins. So, uh, so I mean, like, yeah. for instance, here, could you think of some level of information as encoded in the interaction between the gene product and the physical laws of it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, another way of thinking about this, the complexity of this is to try and measure the complexity of this network, right? And you know, people have sort of tried to do that. So we we know you know we can we can sort of measure these networks fairly well in bacteria. It's quite hard to do in humans. Uh, you know, protein protein interactions are, ha are hard to actually measure, and protein DNA interactions are even harder to measure. So I don't think you know we can make a kind of quantitative statement, but you know that's certainly one way that's sensible to think about it. Um, what about other genomic features? So, okay, well here I'm just showing you a comparison between the sort of like four most popular model organisms, so humans, Drosophila, C. elegans, and, and yeast, and you know, genome size varies a lot, the number of genes doesn't vary that much, particularly Are there C. Any elegans. organisms that have more genes than humans? Yes. There are quite a lot. There are quite a lot. Uh, you're kind of pulling the wool over eyes here by putting humans there with 24,000 genes and then everything else with so, you know, on the scale of things, 24,000 genes is, is a lot of genes. I mean, there aren't many things with that much, with more genes. But like and, a cow has like eight. Yeah. So are cows more complex than humans? That's for you to decide. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to take. I came here for I'm you. Gonna, I'm not going to take. Well, I'm, no, I'm going to give you questions. So you know that is a good, so that so equally that's a good question. How how might you how might you measure that? So one thing that does vary enormously and, and that humans have a lot more of are, are introns. So you see actually, you know, th so this is, the, this is the average length of exonic sequence per gene, and this is the average length of intronic sequence per gene. And you see humans have an order of magnitude more than Drosophila, or two orders of magnitude more than C. elegans. So we might think these, we might think introns, and, 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 and sorry, these are, they also, they ha so humans have more introns. So humans have an average of about eight introns per gene, adding up to 32 uh, kilobases. So we might think that these introns are important uh, in complexity. So, okay, apologies if everyone knows this, but you know, what do introns do? Well, okay, so this is a cartoon of, of a gene, and a gene is made up of sort of bits of exonic sequence separated by, uh, by introns. And the ribosome transcribes this into, into RNA, trans transcribes the introns as well. And then cellular machinery called the spliceosome comes along and, and sits on the RNA and, and splices out all the introns, right, and joins the exons together in the right order. And then this gets translated and, and folds into, into a protein. Right. So, okay, this blank space here implies there's something else, and in fact there is. So, actually, many genes, and I'll come to how many in a minute, uh, can be alternatively spliced. So, 
sometimes this, the, the, the exons can be shuffled in different orders, and that gives you a different protein product, have a completely different function. Okay, so in humans, okay, again, this is hard, this is hard to measure, right? So, 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 in, so, so we measure this by sequencing RNA from cells, and when you do that, if you sequence enough RNA, you start to find that pretty much every possible transcript is represented. The question of how many of them actually make protein products is, is, uh, is, un, is kind of unknown. But at least half of all human genes have you know, alternative transcripts which are expressed at, re at pretty high levels. Um, and they tend to be expressed in different tissues and at different developmental stages. Right? So, we're going to show you an example here. So this is the human gene, uh, and you're reading along the sequence from left to right here, and these, each line is a different transcript of this gene. So the, the sort of solid bits here are, are, are the exons, and, and the dashed bits along here are the introns. Right? And this is sort of typical that you know, small exonic regions separated by, by long introns. And, and this gene has a large number of alternative transcripts. Not all of these actually make protein products, but... Actually, in this particular case, the, you know, these longer transcripts are expressed in the adult brain, and the shorter transcripts are expressed in the fetal heart. Right? So this gene probably does different things at different stages of development. Uh, but you know, a lot of these transcripts don't actually make protein products, so they're just kind of noise. And actually, this trans the, these transcripts at the top are fusion transcripts of, of two genes, of, of this gene, another gene which is a bit upstream. Yeah. Which has a stop code on yeah. in well, the wrong yeah. place. Along part of its length, it's, it's identical to another RNA, so it actually causes it, it actually regulates the levels of, of the RNA that is transcribed. Yeah. So you know, sure, all these may all have you know these are all you know these these transcripts all exist in the cell at the same time, and it's hard to say that they don't actually do anything. I'm not saying that, but some of them really are expressed at very low levels, and also. You know, many of these transcripts actually just get broken down, some of them by nonsense-mediated decay, as you say, and, and there are other pathways which break down some of these transcripts. So, you might be, so, you know, the sort of natural explanation for this is that, okay, you know, you've got another, a limited number of genes and you want to become more complex, you want to express these genes in more combinations, so, you know, maybe you start shuffling the genes around and then you can express them at different times and get more complexity. Is this actually a good argument? So, I'm going to just present an argument that says no. So, okay, first of all, there's quite a large cost to having big introns and lots of splicing, right? So, you know, you have to transcribe all the introns. That's, there's a cost to do that. Okay, you have to make a spliceosome, and there's a cost to do that. You know, alternative splicing is a very noisy process. You know, so, you know, so much so that there are specific pathways which break down transcripts which have been... Um, which have been misspliced, and you know, perhaps even more convincingly, actually, you know, mutations in splice sites, you know, really have fitness effects, right? So, I mean, estimates vary, but somewhere between a third and a half of all human genetic diseases are caused by mutations in splice sites, right? So, you know, this, so, so it's, you know, it's a pretty big cost. And so, what I'm showing you here, and this is an argument uh, by Michael Lynch, is a plot across different species. So each dot is a different species. <coughs> And this shows you, uh, okay, you can think of this as a proxy for population size on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, in the solid dots, is an average number of introns per gene, and, and the open dots are the average length of the introns per gene. Right? Species with larger population sizes have fewer introns and smaller introns. Right? Now, if it was adaptive to have lots of introns, you'd expect this relationship to be the other way around. Right? Remember, selection acts more efficiently when population size is large. Okay. So this would be a sort of model where introns are right. So oh, I should have said probably earlier, so you know, introns have been around for a long time. So in, introns were probably present in the original eukaryotes. Um, but introns, this is a model where introns kind of spread as, a, as selfish DNA elements in a neutral way, and then later get co-opted in order to get alternative splicing and, and more complexity. Right. But the initial step need not be adaptive. Okay. Silence. Okay, so I should, you know, this is, this is controversial, right? I mean, this is not 
you know, not everyone not everyone would accept this, but you know, I think it's certainly a, it's a null hypothesis, right? And I think you need to disprove this before you start talking about the adaptability of introns. Okay, so I'm going to change tack a bit. And rather than talking about the complexity of the genome, we're going to start talking about the complexity of the organism itself. And you know, so back to the quote at the start, you know, Maynard Smith and Zathmari defined these major transitions in the history of life. right? And they defined them as major changes in the way in which information is stored and transmitted between generations. Right? So they're you know, qualitative changes. And I mean... Okay, so you know, number eight is a bit silly, and, and one to three are sort of a bit lost in the mist of time. But I'm going to say a little bit about, about the middle four. And you know, again, I think pretty much all of these has been touched on over time. So this would be a good point for people to step in and, and say, what they, say what they think. So okay, you know, we've heard a lot about prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I'm just going to point out this cartoon of the differences between them. You know, prokaryotes are small, they have a cell wall, they have circular chromosomes. Eukaryotes, so eukaryotic cells are much bigger. You know, they have linear chromosomes, which they keep in a separate nucleus. Uh, they have a cytoskeleton, which means they can change shape and be larger. Um, we showed on here, but they sort of compartmentalize different cellular processes into, into different compartments. And, and perhaps most importantly, they have mitochondria. Right? And mitochondria are sort of little organelles which uh, generate... ATP, which is a chemical used by other cellular processes in order to do stuff. So they basically produce, they basically allow, it, they basically produce this mechanism that allows other cellular processes to use the energy that the cell creates. Okay. We, as we mentioned this yes. yesterday, but it looks like the transcriptional regulation you know, machinery is very different. Uh, in mitochondria? In, in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And just oh, another, yeah. another difference. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay, the, the, this is not all the differences, but, you know, these are sort of the, the, the major. Um, and, you know, we actually, so the, the evolution of mitochondria is sort of like, is the classic, like, crazy idea that turned out to be right. And it turns out that mitochondria are actually the result of symbiosis between two ancient species of bacteria. So here's the sort of cartoon of that. So down here we have kind of, you know, pre eukaryotic life, and there's a sort of complex reticulated phylogeny down here. And uh, the ancestor of all eukaryotes, in, which is here on this purple lineage, at some point probably lost its cell wall, and then the ancestor, and then absorbs the ancestor of mitochondria into the cell. Right? And then at some point, some of the mitochondrial genes were, were transferred to the nucleus of, of, the, of the eukaryotic cell. We'll come back to that in a minute. And then, you know, this and then this other bacteria which had evolved photosynthesis was absorbed into um, one of these eukaryotic lineages and, and became plants. And, and this this actually happened several times, so algae are a separate lineage on which this happened. But, the, you, but, the, but mitochondria probably only evolved once, right? so this was a single event. And it's fairly easy to see how this could evolve as uh, you know, a symbiotic relationship which is beneficial to both of the participants. Right? So mitochondria lives inside the cell, it gets to you know, have a good place to live and divide, probably gets some protection, the cell gets something that it can use. I mean, it's what happens in this initial stage is hard to, you know, we have really no idea about. You know, I think we have no idea why this was initially beneficial for the cell, but it's not hard to imagine why it would be. The statement. But is, that implies that the eukaryote, eukaryote is made by the endosymbiotic event of mitochondria. Do you have a slide of skeleton to do that? And the nucleus has a membrane? Yeah. So is this... I, I'm... I, I, don't, I, I don't know at which point on this tree the cytoskeleton and the nucleus evolve. Before the engulfment of mitochondria, the genes have to go somewhere and uh, it has to be engulfed. It doesn't matter too much. It's a Presumably. I mean, it's li it's a, so it's likely that the, I mean, the cell wall was probably lost before the mitochondria was engulfed, because otherwise you can't engulf. <laughs> but you know, the other, 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 you know, other aspects I don't think we really know about. Yeah. Archaea also undergo ATP cycles. Right? How, how else would they get their energy? Archaea? I don't know. Does anyone know how Archaea get their energy? I, I thought all life gets its energy from ATP. No. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so, so why should uh, only prokaryotes uh, 
give rise to mitochondria, which is the sort of... Uh, are, are, you say, are you saying why, why archaea don't have mitochondria? Or, 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 or what not? They, they surely have an ATP cycle. Right. But I mean that... It's right. efficient in labor, so it's more efficient in the concentration. I mean, I, you know, I... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't speak for the for the origin of the archaea. I, I don't know if anyone here. No, are you saying so. the big lineage was making ATP, but then it got the mitochondria, and then it stopped. It, lo it lost somewhere up here. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Maybe who knows? This was oh, yeah. this was you know. <coughs> All cells need ATP. You carry that to get it from the mitochondria, and then from nowhere else. Presu presu presumably, ATP. presumably, you know. Results. I mean, we, you know, we, I don't think we know how how old this relationship is, right? I mean, it's over two billion years. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Not four, okay. not one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Presumably, uh, the prokaryotes uh, had a more efficient way of executing the ATP cycle than the than archaea, and that's why they took over that function. Right? Presumably. I, d I mean, I, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't I say that. The, the thing that yeah. mitochondria was already a much more complex thing than archaeal bacteria. That's why, why I said that. So this diagram <coughs> feels seriously misleading to me in the sense that instead of you have two equivalent entities and one engulfs the other and you're right. asking why. Right. And my feeling is the, the figure looks... Okay, like so yeah, so there are a bunch of changes <coughs> at yeah. this point on the lineage, so right? That That's, you know, yeah, okay. So okay, so so let me let me let me generalize that statement and just say there's a bunch of changes on all of these lineages everywhere, right? So you know, but any you know any statement you want to make it can be okay, okay. So that you know, let okay, we've heard a lot about the evolution of sex. So, but I just want to make it clear that you know, there are lots of things associated with sex, which you know have all, which are also complex and which have also evolved, but aren't you know necessarily the same. So. You know, recombination, you know, sex and recombination are not the same thing. You know, it seems to happen a lot of the time, but you know, you can have recombination without sex, and you can have sex without recombination. So, you know, the evolution of recombination is, is in some ways a separate but related problem. The evolution of sexes is, again, a separate but related problem, right? You don't need to have, you know, separate male or female organisms uh, in order to have sex. The evolution of, of obligate sex is another problem, right? So, okay, let me go through it. So, so, the, so this is just concentrating on animals, right? But there are asexual animals. They tend, on, on evolutionary scales, you know, they tend to go extinct quite quickly, right? There aren't many asexual animals that look like they have been around for a long time. So it sort of seems like it's possible to, to lose sex, but then you go extinct quickly. The only possible exception are, are these guys, are bedelloid rotifers little microscopic animals and they it's claimed that they have been asexual for something on the order of 80 million years they have very weird genomes so you know it's possible it's possible that's true or it's possible that their weird, weird genomes are obscuring the fact that they're having sex but but generally you know everything else is uh, everything everything else that's that's asexual is is young you know a lot of animals are, are, are facultative so that they, they you know they have sex some of the time but not all of the time and they sort of range, so, you know, the black tip sharks, you know, they can, uh, you know, they have sex almost all the time, but when conditions are very bad, they can basically clone themselves. Female sharks can clone themselves. You know, Daphnia, uh, they tend to be uh, asexual when conditions are good, and then be sexual when conditions are bad, right? So maybe that helps them to, to adapt. Some lineages of, of Daphnia are, are, are asexual. And C. elegans, uh, you know, as I think, as, as Boris mentioned, you know, you see elegans is most of the time it's, it's selfing, but th there are occasionally occasional males. The sea elegans aren't male or female; they're either hermaphrodites or males. So, but generally, males are quite rare. D and Daphnia don't have sex chromosomes, actually. So, d so Daphnia don't have male or females. And, and then, you know, some animals are obligate sexual, so they they have to ha they have to have sex in order to reproduce. And if you think about it, you know, this is quite a strange thing to evolve, right? You know, you're giving up the option to clone yourself. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to imagine why. It's hard to imagine why you would give that up. And in some of these, so in mammals, for example, actually mammals have imprinted genes. So, you know, you've got one copy of your genome from your mother and one from your father. 
for some of your genes, you'll only express the copy you got from your mother, and from some of your genes, you'll only express the copy you got from your father, right? And that's sort of a barrier to cloning yourself, because if you clone your if you clone yourself, you know, female, you clone yourself, then you know the, your daughter will not have a paternal copy of these imprinted genes, so she won't express it, right? So that's something that sort of pre prevents mammals becoming asexual. But it's sort of hard to think about how, it's sort of hard to imagine how that might evolve. What's the benefit? Of, of what? Of obligate sexuality, right. So, you know, okay, yeah, we've heard there's, a lot of explanations. That, 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 that arrow yeah. on the previous side, that's just increasing frequency of sex. That's all that means. Right, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, zero and one and, and some, something in the middle. Okay, so, okay, there are lots of explanations for sex and we've heard a lot of them. I'm not gonna go into them. I sort of, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things which suggest some benefit. There's, you know, mother's ratchet, which removes deleterious alleles and, and, and there are sort of like explanations that are, that are basically neutral. And, yeah? So, uh, in, in evolution, do you ever see uh, a gene you mean thing, things that have been sexual that become asexual? Yes. Yes. So all, so all those examples I showed which, which are asexual are, have lost sex. Really, the first one? Yeah. Yeah. But they were sexual, they were sexual and, and they've lost sex. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's common and well, it's relatively common in plants as well. Plants, well, most plants are, are facultative, <laughs> but you know, the same. So, yeah. They, they, you know, because when they become asexual, you know, they become extinct very quickly. So, you know, there are lots of explanations for, for sex and why it's, you know, why it's good. I mean, a lot of these explanations it's very, it's, are easy to explain on the group level, but hard to explain to the individual, right? So, you know, Muller's ratchet removes deleterious variation. You know, it's good for the population, right? You have, you know, your species doesn't go extinct, but it's not so good for the, but, you know, sex is not so good for, necessarily so good for the individual, right? So, you know, I think thinking about how, we're exp how we explain sex, we need to actually separate out some of the explanations into, and you, and you know, and, di and okay, of course these explanations are not exclusive, right? So there are lots of benefits, we we'll say lots of disadvantages, but it's possible that the benefits which are selected on to uh, start having sex are different from the benefits which maintain it, which are different from the advantages which cause you to become obligate sexual rather than facultative. So, you know, there's probably no <coughs> one overall explanation. Okay, multicellularity, okay, this is again, you know, this is an aggregation of smaller units into uh, larger, more complex units, and then again, there's a sort of hierarchy from single cells to colonies, and really the sort of key step in, in multicellularity is specialization, where some cells actually specialize and give up the ability to reproduce, right? So, you know, in some ways, they become altruistic towards the rest of the organism, and so, you know, it's relatively easy to get single cells to aggregate into colonies. Bacterial biofilms are a common example. And you know, we heard on, in Oscar's talk this morning, there are, um, you know, it's relatively easy in experimental evolution settings to get yeast to, to grow into clumps and things like that. It seems to be a bit harder to actually grow, you know, truly multicellular organisms. And this algae is a kind of model for, for the very early evolution of multicellularity. So, it, so it, these are sort of spheres and the cells on the outside are, are, are specialized for swimming and, and eating and, and then some of the cells on the inside are specialized for reproduction. And the cells on the outside can no longer reproduce independently. And you know, so that seems to be slightly harder to obtain, although you know, it's easy enough that it's happened many times. So it's probably happened at least 25 times. This is the tree of life and, the, and the, this is just Okay, well, you know, red shows you multicellularity and, and black cells you, shows you unicellularity and it's, it's, you know, it's evolved on all of these lineages separately. Okay, but again, you know, explanations for this is, you know, it's easy to see how it's good for the organism as a whole, but it's not necessarily easy to see how it's good for the individual, right? Why is it good for the cell to be part of a larger organism if it's not going to reproduce? Yeah. Yeah, unless they all have the same genotype and then it doesn't matter. Right, yeah. So, okay, and I'm just, you know, just, fi just, just, fi just finally, um, 
you know, social behavior, okay, you know, this is like cells coming together to make an organism, this is individuals coming together to make a society and, and behaving altruistically. And, and in many ways, it, it's, you know, it sort of requires the same explanation. Okay, this is, these are bees who have died in the process of killing this wasp which has attacked their hive, right? So, they, you know, the bees have sacrificed themselves for the good of the hive. Okay. But, it do, but it doesn't matter because they're female workers and they don't <coughs> produce anyway, right? So it's hard, you know, it's hard to, you know, again, you know, it's hard to see how that, you know, how that would evolve. So the sort of classical explanation, and, and probably I think the one that, that most biologists today still believe is, is something along the lines of kin selection. And this basically says, you know, if I am closely related to you, then I, it's good for me to do something to help you because that helps your genes, which are the same as mine, right? And it's sort of summed up by, by Hamilton's rule. Uh, and so here, C is, is the cost to me, B is the benefit to you, and, and R is our relatedness, right? So if I'm closely related to you, I'll, I'll do something at a cost to me that benefits you. And really, the, the devil here is in what R is. Okay, so it's some measure of how closely we are related, and depending on how exactly you define it, you can get quite different behaviors uh, from this rule. But this is, the, this is sort of the, this is the general idea. Right? It's just interesting in this regard that yeah. Nicole King on campus here has been looking at uh, formation of colony, colonial plant flagellates, which mm -hmm. are the precursors to sponge. And what she seems to see is what happens is the multicellularity arises not from the aggregates of separate individuals that therefore have separate genotypes, so therefore you've got to evoke this, mm. as opposed to so the incomplete division of cells. Right. And if that's true, then they're all the same genotype, and it solves this problem completely. Right, absolutely. Right. So, so which is completely yeah. missing, almost completely missing from the literature. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, so if you so look at, so your body, all the cells in your body are more or less the same genotype, and so you know it's not so you, you know it's sort of easy to invoke this argument. On the other hand, you know it happens quite commonly that cells in your body decide to go crazy and just try and replicate themselves at the expense of your body. You know, in fact, it's so common that it you know if you wait long enough, it will be, it will happen to everyone. So, you know, any explanation has to take that into account, right? But, you know, there's a strong pressure. There's a strong pressure to to break out from this. You know, you know. So in, yeah. Okay, so uh, you know it's sort of often often set up as an alternative to kin selection is, is group selection, multi-level selection, and this basically invokes selection on on different levels. Right? So you know there's selection on the level of the individual when they aggregate to form a group. There's selection on the level of the group, uh, you know, which preserves traits in the individual. Right now, you know it's, it's relatively easy to model this. It, it's sort of harder to find kind of real mechanistic explanations, right? And, you know, and this is, this is fairly controversial among biologists, yeah, I think. Yeah, so, like yeah. 120 of right. the most experienced right. biologists in the discipline wrote a reply. To right, so, yeah, so exactly. So, so I was going so to say, this, this is a sort of recent and extremely controversial paper advocating a model of, of group selection and, and, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't quite, yeah. I who, who didn't understand? So, ha so, so half the world says that they no Akadal don't understand what's going on, and half and no Akadal say the rest of the world doesn't. Explain. Why do we have to choose one half? Yeah, Can well, it, it, right. There was a miscommunication. I think it's worth. I, I think I think it's worth reading this paper. Although, I, you know, you, you really you have to read the supplementary information because the the paper itself doesn't have have much in it. But you know, the, the, well, you know, why do you quote that paper rather than earlier stuff on group selection? Like, by just because I want to be topical oh, okay. and you know <laughs> and, and current. I mean, there's you know there, there's there's an old literature on group selection and there's an old literature bashing group selection and and you know this debate has been going on for you know I don't know the best part of a century, right? So. Right. <laughs> Very good point. Sorry. So, the, okay. So the question was, could it be that this debate is asking questions which are not easily falsifiable? And I think that's been a real problem, you know, because it's very hard to test for this in, in nature, right? I mean, there are a lot of you know, there are experiments do this, but you know, there's nothing really convincing, I think. And that and that's kind of the that's kind of the root of the problem. So if we want, you know, really, what we need to think about, if you know, if we want to understand which models are, are useful. 
we need to be designing experiments that can actually test them. When you say multi-level selection, are you implying that it's not, it's something separate from kin selection? Because you can think about right. Kin selection so so kin, kin selection implies a certain level of group selection, yeah. right? Sure, but you know something. But there are, there can be additional terms. Group selection right? without kin selection. You could imagine. I mean, they can both. You know, they can both be. You know, I mean, you know, th these groups are likely group are likely to be related. Even they're not genetically related, possibly. Yes, or you know, additional. So you know, your your social group is likely to be related to you, and, and that and so kin selection implies some level of group selection. But if there's additional, if there's an additional term on top of that, that sort of implies okay. So you know, these things are not exclusive. Okay, I mean, you know, what else? So, okay, so I talked I talked about um, I talked about cancer, and you know, the reason you don't get cancer all the time is because you have you know, a complex mechanism which pr which says that when cells start to divide out of control, they kill themselves, right? Breaks down, stops cancer. And, and you know, there are, there, at all levels, there are sort of control mechanisms which evolve to keep, keep the system in place. Of course, you know, this is really just pushing the problem elsewhere, right? Because these control mechanisms have to evolve in the first place, right? So, you know, imprinting makes animals be obligate sexual, but how did that evolve in the first place? That's just pushing the question elsewhere. Um, and the last thing I want to emphasize is, you know, we don't necessarily have to look for selection, right? You, you know, we don't, we're arguing about what kind of selection is important, but you know, actually maybe there's just no selection. Okay, remember, you know, weakly deleterious alleles still have quite a big chance to fix in a small population. And the population size of humans is quite small. So the long-term effects of population size of humans is is maybe 10 to the 4. And this is a plot showing you estimates of population size over time. So this is the present. You're going back in time in years. And, and the y-axis shows you the effects of population size. And, and 1 is, is 10, to the, 10 to the 4. So, and, and the different lines show you different colored populations. Right? And so for some populations, particularly for, for Europeans here, you know, sometimes in the past, the population size has been very low. So this is the, this is the out of Africa bottleneck. Population size, you know, the effect of population size is like 100. Okay, so, you know, and humans are probably not unique in species in having gone through regular large bottlenecks. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if a lot of the variation we see is actually just, you know, not selective at all. We're just looking in the wrong place. So, you know, this is the, the model where, you, you know, you're at a, you're at a fitness peak and, and you can fall down by drift. And then maybe you climb up somewhere else. In the first plot, yeah. so this is is time in the past, right? So the the, the origin is the present. Well, the origin is ten thousand years ago, and, and and you're going back in time, on a log scale. And the y-axis is the effective population size of humans, so something which we think is proportional to the population size, um, and and in I units of ten. That, to that, okay, so, okay. I don't want to get into it. In some, in some, okay, so in some models, the effect of population size is proportional to the population size, right? But the point is, for this, for this argument, you know, what it, what's important is the effect of population size, right? So the, 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 the definition that says deleterious alleles will fix with this probability is the same as the definition which gives you this plot. So, the, you know, what's important is, is this plot, not the census population no, no, no. size. Sorry, wait, I mean like a neutral allele fixes the probability 1 over 2n with the, the real population size. It's in one copy. Uh, it's it's, it's yeah. the real population size. It's, it, and he tells you like the, the selective coefficient below which it's neutral. That's, okay. so the, the, that, the, the, that's yeah. true. Okay, so any, any, tells you, any tells you how strongly selection, selection yeah. will act. But, you know, these population sizes, you know, really are very small. That's, okay. So I just I, so I just want to finish by saying what well, as I said before, you know I think we've got lots of models right. We've seen lots of models. Everyone's talked about different models, and they're all good models. But you know, and they're probably all valid, you know, in some parameter regime, you know, for some species in some place in time. And the question is, you know, really, what's the relative importance of all these different models, and what predictions do they make that we can actually go out and test, you know, in nature? Um, I don't. I think maybe Daniel's going to go into the complexities of some of these models a bit more, but that's really all I've got to say, so thanks.